Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Project Egg Show. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Adam Homey. Now, Adam is the executive director of In Demand Expert. He's also the host of the wildly popular Business Creators Radio Show, one of the longest running entrepreneurial podcasts on the air today. He's also an author of the international Amazon best selling book, Journeys to Success, the Millennial Edition, and Groundhog Day is an event, not a business strategy. I actually tripped over my own words. He's a feature contributor in the Amazon international bestseller, Journeys to Success, the Millennial Edition, and author of Groundhog Day is an event, not a business strategy. And he's also a general badass. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your digital hands together for Adam Homie. How are you doing today, Adam? Ben, it is an honor and a pleasure. We're going to have so much fun today. I can't wait. Me neither. Let's jump right in. All right. What is, what is your story? Okay, so there's several different versions of the story I can tell depending on what starting point we want to go to. But let me just share the part that I think is going to be most relevant based on having followed Project Egg and seen some of your awesome episodes so far is after I completed MBA school in the year 2002, I had the idea when I was in MBA school that I was going to become a training and development director for a Fortune 500 company. And so I got out of co- MBA school. I got my MBA. I did the interviews and networking. I got a couple job offers, including one company that wasn't even really in hiring mode, but they really enjoyed our conversation. So they were going to create a position for me. So this was all pretty exciting stuff. Now, around the same time, I reconnected with one of my previous business mentors from a couple years back. And at that point, he had gone independent and was the president of his own training and development firm. So I started doing some work with him, helping him develop his presentations, analyze his participant data. And then I got involved in helping him do research for his book that he published in 2003. So this became sort of a side gig where I continued to hold down my uh, graduate era job and even got promoted there. And for about a year, year and a half, I was kind of back and forth, the old ox and the horse cart thing, trying to figure out uh, back when, for those of us who didn't quite know back then, Uh, how to get enough clients so that I can make the jump, but then make the jump so I could get more clients. So it seemed like an ox and a horse cart thing. And if I knew then what I knew today, what I know today, it wouldn't have taken two years. It probably would have taken about two months based on how I was actually able to do it and how I leveraged connections and networking more than money. See, my thing was I thought I was going to need a whole lot of money to get it going But what really got my first business off the ground was just connections, being of service to people and becoming memorable so they would think of me when they had needs for the things that I offered. And that is one of the driving passions behind what I do today. I have a consulting firm called the Business Creators Institute. And as you mentioned, I'm also executive director of In Demand Expert, which is a podcast and live stream booking agency. And through both of those things, what we emphasize is the power of human connection and how we can be of service to each other so that we can, as they say, create the rising tide that buoys all ships. Dude, you're absolutely speaking my language because one of the things that I'm the most fascinated with is human connection, right? Because I I think about this all the time, like the people who are really the movers and shifters of our society, of our world they are extremely connected right. to, to the other movers and shifters and to the masses, to the people. So one thing that I'm interested in is what is your philosophy on building deep, meaningful, and genuine human connection? Wow, and that's a pretty deep, genuinely loaded question. So let me see if I can put that in a sentence or two that will be a benefit to your followers and listeners. I think that what really drives that forward is when we are able to serve from an overflowing cup. Inside my book, Groundhog Day is an event, not a business strategy, I ask the question, is greed good? Some of us are thinking of that movie Wall Street from 1987 where the Michael Douglas character gave that speech where he said greed is good. What I like to point out is he did not say greed is good. 
never mind the trailers, never mind the little clips on YouTube. If you go back to the actual speech that he gave, and I like to play this when I get up on stages, he said, greed, for lack of a better word, is good. And then he spoke about the passion for life, the passion for knowledge, the passion for love, and how all of these things have contributed to the upward surge of mankind. And the way I look at it is when you are able to look at your language and be very careful about the powers of the, powers of the words that you are saying, the powers of the words you are reading, the powers of the words you are writing, you can unleash potential just by shifting a few things. So what I, the reason I bring that up is... Because he did not actually say greed is good, he wasn't trying to validate something that we've been taught is bad. What that phrase, the correct phrase, greed for lack of a better word is good, it opens up a conversation because it's not saying greed is good. It's saying greed is something. I'm not sure what the word is for it here. I'm gonna have to explain a little bit further. I'm not saying it's good, but I'm saying let's dig into this a little bit further. And you can take any concept uh, and explore it a little bit further by simply adding that phrase for lack of a better word. And it leads you down the quest of what is a better word? And the more we can do that, the more we can find our brilliance and our passion that will fuel us so that we can serve from an overflowing cup. Because what can, what can you do for the world more effectively from an overflowing cup versus giving your last dime? When do you feel the most connected to another person? Like if somebody was trying to build a connection with you, what would be the most effective way that they could do so? Here's what I like to tell people by example. And what you're going to discover is I like to teach through anecdotes and stories. People look at my personal Facebook profile and they see some of my rants. I speak about minimalism. I speak about uh, introversion. I speak about how selfies literally kill people. And I've had business coaches and mentors and people who want to help saying, what are you doing talking about this crap? Well, here's the thing. I'm showing people a little bit of who I am, and I'm introducing conversations, touching on themes that people find interesting because I want them to see me as a human being, not simply as an avatar, not simply as a marketing message that happens to have a name and a head. If you want to speak about my actual LinkedIn business strategy, that's where you and I connected. Uh, in Demand Expert was in the process. We had some guests that we wanted to get on some shows, and in my research, Project Egg came up, but we thought it'd be a great outlet, and so I connected with you directly through business. Now, what's great is we're getting to know each other other ways as well, but what I'm doing is I'm drawing a distinction. Uh, in one place, it's all business, all business, all business, and then once those business connections are created, we expand to other things. In other places, it's pretty much all social, all social, all social, and if the know, like, and trust develop, then we add the business piece of it. So we're approaching different angles from different places. So when I feel the most connected, it, it depends on where it initially begins. Uh, candidly, I reached out to you because I had a business need. You responded and we were able to help each other and we're continuing to help each other. Uh, if I had met you at a conference or you'd been a listener to my podcast or I met you at a networking meeting or something, then we might've done it the other way. So the answer is it depends and you focus on where can we be of service to each other from the beginning. Let's jump back into your childhood. All right. What did it smell like? Grass. Why? Because I grew up in a rural area and I love cutting grass. What was your, what was your home life like? My home life like? Um, well, we lived out in the country. It was my parents and my sister. And, you know, it was one of those things where, I didn't really have quite an understanding of the world around me. Uh, when I became an adult, uh, how do I say this? And my mom watches some of these, so I got to make sure I say this correctly, is my parents kind of surprised me. And what I mean by that, and that's, a, and that's a positive thing, is they had a unique level of perceptiveness about communication that I was only able to appreciate as an adult. As a child, candidly, I didn't appreciate and I made sure they knew it. But as an adult, I recognized that they had a bigger view in mind than simply making sure that we got fed and clothed. They were raising me and my sister to be leaders, to be people who give back, to people who are able to go out there and find what it is we're looking for and put ourselves in a position to serve from an overflowing cup. So it's kind of a long game sort of thing. 
that I came to appreciate as an adult and I wouldn't change anything if I had the chance to do it again. How did they instill those values? Well, um, part of it was by example and, um, the, you know, they, they love the phrase, do as I say, not as I do. So they would tell me not to F and G D swear in those words. So, <laughs> uh, it, so it turned me into the kind of person who actually has to censor his thoughts before they come out of his mouth. And sometimes on my own podcast, the business creators radio show, yeah, I do drop F bombs and I say, boy, look at those people. They're a bunch of freaking morons and stuff like that because that's just the nature of how I communicate. Now, there are studies out there that show that people who are able to speak expansively in that way, sometimes even using some profanity, uh, that can actually be viewed as a sign of intelligence. Now, that's one piece of it. Another piece of it, I think there was some reverse psychology going on. So they used some of those things to show me what not to do so that I would appreciate what to do. Again, it's one of those things you come to appreciate more as an adult. How did the dynamic between you and your sister evolve over time? Well, let's see. Wow, this is, uh, this is some pretty deep stuff. I thought we were just going to talk about podcasting here, but boy, we're really getting to the root of things here. Uh, and she watches these too. So how do I say this so that I don't get my butt kicked the next time I go home to visit? Um, <laughs> uh, she and I are two very different people when, when you look at it candidly. Um, I uh, had very little regard for the norms of what you're supposed to do. I didn't view myself really as part of the larger community of where I grew up. I was sort of a misfit. Uh, I couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. Um, she, on the other hand, uh, has the story where she met her lifelong love in high school. She, be, uh, They became sweethearts. They got married. They have the big house, and they've added two big additions to it. They have the acreage. Uh, they have bulldogs. And their focus in life is toward a version of wealth, wealth acquisition that is based upon basically – being still. So building what you have. I mean, as I said, they have the big property. They have uh, lots of nice cars. They have this big house and they're putting all kinds of additions on it. They've made this thing really, really nice. And they also have a connection to the land, so to speak. Uh, you know, our family's from that area. His family um, is from that area and have been very prominent in commerce and business in that area for four generations now. So it's just natural to them that they kind of stayed where they were. Me, I looked at it as this is really nothing more than a springboard for me. I don't see my future here. So my view was always looking elsewise. And so growing up, uh, you know, I didn't really think I had a whole lot in common with her. And it's one of those funny things you discover when you're an adult and you get to look at things from the 2020 view of retrospection, that there's actually a lot in common. So when you were at home and growing up, what were some of those activities that you did enjoy? My dad built me a fort for my little green army men. I had about 20 bags of those little green army men. I had the Jeeps, I had a helicopter that made the propeller spin by pulling the trigger. And this fort had electricity and running water. I would, uh, I divided my green army men into do two different armies and we would stage battles all the time. And then I had a, a medical triage unit on the back end. It had, a, uh, it had a motor shop to fix the Jeeps. And we would go through all these scenarios of uh, just the entire organization of a military base. And uh, it even had camouflage. The tops of the fort, the roofs, were covered in little model trees and model grass like you'd use in a model train set. Dude, that sounds awesome. <laughs> like, I remember the Little Green Army men because yeah. I totally had those Little Green Army men too. And, like, that that sounds like like every kid's dream. Like, have this fully decked out for it. Uh -huh. that, that's awesome, man. That's really cool. How do you feel that the experiences there helped to shape your identity? Well, this was in the 1980s and I predicted the end of the cold war. 
So um, I guess um, <laughs> uh, I guess what it did is it gave me a prescience to explore further because when I was creating the scenarios, it actually heightened my interest in history and looking at it from history, from the biographical aspect of it, from the political aspect, and from the socioeconomic aspect of it, and how all these things work together. I'm a history nut. One of the biggest dangers I have is I might get st stuck on the Wikipedia and lost at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, I love reading biographies and autobiographies of famous folks, regardless of what you may think of them or you were told we're supposed to think about them by the media. I like to see real people in real situations and how they deal with it. And a lot of what I do in business isn't necessarily gained from reading, you know, those 20 books that we as entrepreneurs are all supposed to read or we're not actually entrepreneurs. Yeah, I read all those books. Okay. I'm familiar with Think and Grow Rich and all that other stuff. And I think it's great. And I, and I put some of that into what I do. But I like to see people who reacted to situations that weren't even necessarily business situations and then compare those to how people would respond to things and function in business situations and note that really there are a lot of similarities. So do you feel as if your, uh, I guess, passion for biographical information and, and studying other people, do you feel like that was kind of the, the precursor to starting your podcast and, and doing the things that you've done professionally? The very first question we ask listeners on the Business Creators Radio Show, I'll, I'll phrase it something like this. I'd say something, I'd say something like, Ben, you know, I just read off your official bio and let me tell you what you're doing and what you're saying is so awesome. I'm not even sure I'm qualified to be on the interview with you and this is my show. But what we'd like to do, because I know some of our listeners are right now, they have a separate browser tab open. They're looking up this Ben Gothard and this Project Egg and they are trying to learn more about him. So let's take a step back and learn a little bit more about Ben the man, or if you're a woman, Ben the woman, and, uh, and discover more about what's brought you to, on your journey to where you are today serving business creators from your intersection of your brilliance and your passion. So basically, we take, we've done this entire interview, and we put it in about five to ten minutes. Now, some guests are different. Uh, I've had guests on the show where it's a 60-minute show, and I'd be at minute 44, and be like, wow, I haven't asked a question yet, but they've already answered all mine. So sometimes you get that flow and it's really exciting. And I found that when people tap into their own stories and they can translate that back to the topic that they're presenting today, that it tends to just flow naturally like that. So when I look at podcasts and I look at live streaming, I'm very excited about how this is all expanded. Uh, I believe that with, the, with social media, instant media, and the access to information and communications that did not exist 30 years ago when I was growing up. I, I refer to it as the, the democratization of information dissemination. I, and I call it a blessing and a curse. The curse is people post a bunch of crap on Facebook and say, if you don't agree with this, unfriend me now. <laughs> no. The positive side is it gives us a voice and it gives us the choice and the power to use that to influence and serve others. So when we're able to look at the stories, uh, that helps to create the connections. One of my favorites is I have a client in my consulting firm. It's been here for over three years. And she showed up on my doorstep one day. And I actually heard of her and thinking, wow, she's way up here. This is like, this is like the clients I'm hoping to start finding a way towards next year. And here she is knocking on my door making the case that she should be my client. And how do we connect? She says, oh, I heard you on a podcast somewhere. She can't tell me if it's my show. She can't tell me if it was me being interviewed somewhere else. She couldn't even remember what I said. She just listened to, to my, whether it was my story or some information I gave and decided that it was at least worth a conversation. And we went from there. You mentioned how you, you like to read about different figures in history. Yeah. Which ones have been the most influential to your thinking, your mentality, your mindset? Well, anybody who reads the, my book, Groundhog Day is an event, not a business strategy, knows that I've spent a lot of time studying Winston Churchill because he keeps coming up over and over and over again. 
when it comes to studying figures, I look at how people have acquired and then exercised power. So uh, there's, you know, there's no value judgment on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, at least within the context of what we're discussing. And it goes back to how do people handle situations and what is it about the situation that caused it to handle the way they did? Uh, Winston Churchill, for example, um, if it hadn't been for World War II, he probably would have remembered as this guy who sort of kind of did it, but just never closed a deal. So with him, you discover that your moment may not arrive for quite some time. Uh, and, and another example along those lines is, is William Shatner, somebody who I also have studied and followed for many years. And I've read his books and I've looked at his story. Here's somebody who, you know, after the Star Trek TV show and you think he was really on his upward trajectory, well, his wife left him and he ended up in a divorce and he didn't understand really the United States divorce laws, you know, him being Canadian. He got cleaned out. So five years after Star Trek, he's living in a camper on the back of his pickup truck doing, uh, dressing up as Captain Kirk for children's birthday parties. And then he decided he wasn't going to quite go out like that. So he did whatever it took. He did stupid, cheesy commercials. He did ridiculous uh, cameo guest appearances. Whatever he could do to stay in the game. And what happened later? You know, you, you got... Uh, you got T.J. Hooker. You got other TV shows he did. And then finally, at age 73, he won his first Emmy for a guest appearance on a show that had already been canceled. He won his Emmy twice. He won two Emmys for playing the character Denny Crane. The first time he won for Denny Crane, he won for Denny Crane on The Practice, where he had a six-episode guest arc on the show after it had already been canceled. So they already knew it was the last season, and that was it. And they brought him in at the very end to help complete this story arc of how they transition people moving on from the previous scenario. And then he won it for the second time when he moved that character over to Boston Legal. But the point is, here's the guy who had all these accomplishments, but he didn't get his trophy until he was 73 years old. So if you don't have it yet, keep on keeping on. And that increases the chances you'll get there. And just real quick, along those same lines, the singer and musician Meatloaf, he was really big in the 70s. And then he kind of faded out and he was broke. He had lost his career and he was sitting in some little small town somewhere in the middle of nowhere doing nothing, no place. And he made the decision that this, this wasn't where the meatloaf story ends. So he started doing gigs at the local dive bars. He started doing cameo appearances on a local radio show, whatever it took. And by the 90s, he was rocking again. And he's been upward ever since. It's interesting how the the three people that you mentioned were all very, very distinct. Yes. Why do you think, uh, like, like, how does cer a certain character in history catch your attention? What about them is intriguing to you to where you will then go in and read more about them? Um, two items. When they surprise you by how they actually come out despite what you would have thought of them up until now. And also just looking at how they exercise power in real time, because it's one thing to say, I mean, like, you know, like in our current environment, um, regardless of what you think of president Donald Trump, you can love him and you can say, you know, MAGA, drain the swamp and all that. And you can cheer him on and everything. And then you still have these armchair people say, come on, man, we got to drain the swamp. What the hell is going on? And then you have the people who will go so far as to resist. So you have a pretty wide spectrum. And that happens a lot when you have love-hate figures, which is what Trump is, very much a love-hate figure. And he's always been that way. There's nothing surprising here. But what nobody anywhere on that spectrum that I found anyway, really takes to understand is regardless of who he was as a businessman, regardless of who he is as a person, regardless of what he says at his rallies or in his speeches or anything like that, there's a difference between all of that versus the reality that is given to him when he receives his intelligence briefing in the morning and becomes privy to information that none of us have and has to make decisions based on that without being able to explain it to anybody. This is what we discover in biographies and autobiographies 20 years after the fact. And we say, wow, isn't that interesting? 
So regardless, and, and what I said there is basically evergreen. Take out Donald Trump and insert whoever's president 10 years from now. And I pretty much guarantee you it's going to be the exact same thing, whether it's another person from the conservative or the right, or it's somebody who's more liberal to the left, you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have some of the same dynamics. It may be the same. It may be crisscross. But this is why I generally do not get into political discussions on my Facebook wall. And it's because we have these breaking news things and these controversies and these eruptions and everything else. And by the time the dust settles and facts emerge, everybody's already moved on. So I don't react to it very much because my study of history and, and looking at larger trends tells me that you very rarely get the whole story. And if the story came out 12 minutes ago, you certainly don't have it all. So speak now and be foolish later or hold your peace. Look at it from an analyst's point of view, dispassionately, and you will gain such a wider set of tools that will enable you to respond to situations, whether it's your business, your personal life, or anything else you encounter. When did you first start podcasting and how did you evolve as a podcaster over time? Okay. I got into the game uh, in around 2013. I started showing up as a guest on other people's shows. And up until 2012, I used to post a video on my blog every morning called the Monday Marketing Moments. They've all been deleted. The reason being is a lot of those stories actually made it into my book. So here's the thing about that. I, ended, I stopped doing it at the end of 2012, and I decided I was going to start a podcast. I already knew it was going to be called the Business Creators Radio Show. Believe it or not, we had the website up uh, and everything else. And it was one of those things where we actually didn't get to the launch point until September of 2013. And so that's when I went to apple.com. I submitted my RSS feed and said, I want to get onto iTunes. And they gave me the usual language. Oh, this could take up to four weeks. So I thought, oh, I have time. 24 hours later, I'm approved. Which for, you know, as podcasters know, that means the 30-day clock is ticking. So I had to come up with guests for my show real quick. So I looked around and, okay, you can be on my show? You can be on my show? You on my show? And that's kind of how it got started. Originally, the Business Creators Radio Show was live. And so we've always done it every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. For the first three months, I did it live. And what I kept running into is I'd be traveling a lot. Kind of funny that right around the time my, that time of my life was when I was moving to Las Vegas from Pittsburgh. So what a great time to commit to being in a certain place every week live, right? And I was at a conference at one of those Tuesdays, and in the hotel room, the internet went out. So I had to do it with my smartphone, first off. And then the cellular connection was for crap. So right in the middle of my own interview, I lost connection. Now, the person I was interviewing that day, he's actually a buddy of mine, and uh, he, like, uh, he had given me the questions for, you know, for him, for me to ask him. And this is one of the things that I say is a big part of being a memorable in-demand expert is when you approach your host and you say, these are the suggested interview questions. You and I, to be candid, are doing something a little bit different than my suggested interview questions. And that's fine. But what he had in front of him was he had written out the questions that he wanted me to ask him so that I could properly shine the light on his brilliance and his passion. And we said, Adam, Adam, Adam. Oh, I guess I lost him. Well, cell phone probably broke out in that crappy hotel of his. Okay, guys, I'm going to be Adam. Okay, so the next question is, and he started doing Q&A with himself. And by the time I got on, he said, oh, Adam, we were just talking about you. I decided to leave it up because it was just so funny. After that, we started pre-recording. But a couple of things I, want, I wanted to capture there, and this is a lesson. I'm going to put a lesson on top of the lesson, actually. What I did there was a little bit of seed-based marketing and education. So I wrapped into telling the story a couple best practices, one of which is when possible pre-record. It's just so much easier that way with all the stuff we have going on. And another is when you want to be a guest on a show, when you are looking to be a memorable in-demand expert, come to your host with your topic and your suggested interview questions right there on your one sheet and give it to them up front when you make your pitch to be on their show. 
because that will make you memorable in the crowd of people they're trying to get on that person's show. And they can look down the list and they can see, oh, well, this is, this is what I'm getting with Adam. This is what I'm getting with Ben. I want this or I don't want this, whatever. So you're already standing out because you're showing your host you're easy to interview. Second of all, if the host doesn't have time to listen to five of your interviews or do research on you, well, you got the questions right there. They can just, they can just read them off. And then if the conversation picks up and you start going down natural paths, and so be it. And, and I've discovered this as a host sometimes. that and, and, I, and I was one of the first podcasters to actually require that my guests submit their questions. Back when I started doing that, it was unheard of, and people used to rebel against it. Now it's standard operating procedure. So it's one of those things where I, you know, I told you so. And, uh, and uh, I've had people where I would ask a question, they would say, thank you, Adam, for that great question. And the answer to that question is, so they were obviously reading off a script because they had not yet acquired the level of fluency. So, you know, you do your work with it. I wasn't always fluent. I used to have, have to have a PowerPoint open and notes in front of me, but it was only through sheer repetition and a willingness to get out there and do it again and again and again and again and again and look for brilliance and passion rather than perfection that I got really good at this. So when you came at me and I thought this was going to be a straight up interview about being a memorable man and the man expert, you said, Adam, what happened to you as a child? I was not only ready for it. But I was able to look for those subtle nuances where here and there I could tie it back to the overall message of what it means to be an in-demand expert. The stories themselves are part of the formula because it makes you relatable. It makes you somebody they can connect with. And when you can infuse stories that are relevant to the business that you do, even if you don't come right out and say it, but you, ex ex you exude some of those same trends, then you will achieve that memorability and that flexibility where you can pretty much handle anything. Yeah, I think that's a really great point because I definitely do not stick with any script. Like this right. is not scripted, unedited, totally like off the cuff winging it. And I do that very purposefully yeah. because I feel like it lets the true nature of the, of the guest, in this case yourself, shine through. And, and I think yeah. that's a beautiful thing. So I yeah, let me, uh, yeah, you, oh, yeah, let me you, tell you a little bit about that. Um, my strategy for how I handle my personal Facebook page, I actually discovered that from looking at people on social media who would be snarky and sarcastic and tell funny stories and stuff like that. And I would see them being cited in PowerPoints at seminars with, you know, with their names blotted out. And the message would be, don't do this. But then I'm looking at these folks who are being snarky and sarcastic and telling these stories and, and sometimes just giving you a total WTF reaction. And I'm seeing their businesses just <laughs> And the strategy is really simple. Let people see who you are unvarnished. Let them see a little bit of your personality. Let them see some of your quirkiness and make the decision that you're a fun person for them to work with. Because, I mean, come on, it's business. Let's have some fun. Uh, I, don't, I don't work with people where I feel I have to walk on eggshells and measure my words. In fact, I fired consulting clients because I always had to worry that they would take exception to what I said. I mean, I'm polite, I'm professional and all that. But you know, it's like, if I feel like I have to tiptoe on eggshells around you because I don't want to seem unprofessional, it's not going to work. There are folks out there who are excited to reach that level of accommodation or put another way, there's somebody out there whose style is going to mesh with that style. And as I love to say, and this is something your listeners can take home with them, saying no is a beautiful thing. Say no to success, and I think you know what I mean by that. And remember that when you say no to something, you create somebody's yes. Because if you're turning it down, somebody else is going to pick it up. Just became somebody else's lucky day. That's awesome. So... Adam, we've talked a little bit about uh, where you come from and, and you know, the, the things that have gotten you to where you are today, uh, but can you take uh, you know, a minute or two to really tell us exactly what you're doing now? And don't be afraid to brag a little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So we have a company called In Demand Expert, and what we focus on is helping folks you know, like me and like you become memorable in their quest to become 
known through podcasting and live streaming. We've gotten to the point where you see people's websites and it says, as seen in, you see um, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, BBC, Singapore Times, Daily Mail, Pravda, you could go on and on and on and on and on. And the question becomes, okay, well, you were, you were in the Guardian? Well, wh where's, your, where's, your, where's your article? And there are many ways to get those logos, one of which is you legitimately get that media attention. So you have the articles and the video interviews you can point to. You can do a press release, which will get you the as seen inside of it when your press release is published on that outlet's website. And there's also the companies out there that will arrange for a small fee for you to get mentioned on those networks at three o'clock in the morning when uh, your second cousin once removed step aunt is watching and will post on Facebook, oh, I saw you, Ben, you were so good. But nobody else is watching, so who cares? But you can still say, I was on ABC. Now, I lay all that down because what we're seeing now is when people have their as seen in blocks or as featured in blocks, you're starting to see podcast logos. Like here's a few people out there that think of it as a point of pride. I was seen on the business creators radio show. It's like, yes, yes, major media now, yes. When you have a niche specific, niche focused marketing strategy and you understand who your audience is and who you wanna reach, you become aware of who your audience is listening to, who they're following. And when you get those media placements, and we can, let's call it podcasting and live stream, let's call it the media, because it is. You can put that up there, and not only is that legitimate, and people are going to say, yeah, that's actual media, that's not just some BS, that's actually the real thing. You can say, yeah, I was on Project Egg, uh, go to projectegg.com, here's my episode. Easily provable, social proof. And then they can click play on this video, and they can get to know you for themselves and make their decisions. So what we do is we help people come memorable through that process, make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And we also bring a sense of realism to it. I've seen some folks who want to get into podcasting and say, all right, so my rule is I am not going to be on any show that has less than 10,000 downloads. Okay, so I could ask 20 questions about that, one of which is who's doing the downloading. That's just one of them. Uh, what we share is when you're doing podcasts and you're doing live streams, aside from the fact that these are great ways to get in the media, aside from the fact that they are good search engine marketing strategies because they tend to get posted on websites that will then have backlinks to your website. Yeah, see what I did there? They are also relationship builders. Because I, right now, I know that Project Egg has a lot of followers. Um, I had actually heard of Project Egg from somebody else before I reached out to you. So it's getting around. And I remember that when I first saw it, I'm thinking, wow, it's, you know, these few different categories. It's a really awesome show. And it looks like it's kind of just starting out, but Ben is really on fire here. And this is something I might like to see for myself here. So being on Project Egg could be kind of a big deal. But what I also recognized is they're going to be listeners. They're going to be viewers. They might be watching now. They could be watching a month from now. They could be watching in 10 years when we have a different president. They have to go back 20 minutes to that other example and they have to switch in the name and see if we're crisscrossing at that point, like I said earlier. Uh, but one thing is always going to be the case when you do podcasting and live streaming is your number one listener is your host. That is the one person who's going to have your undivided attention. That is the one person you are pretty much assured you're going to get at least a few moments with either before or afterwards. So you want to talk about networking. Here's another benefit that we share. And on InDemandExpert.com, we list a whole lot of reasons why being a memorable in-demand expert is so important. And one of them is, you know, people say, hey, is there any chance we could meet for coffee and discuss collaboration? Okay, so first of all, no, I don't want to give you free coaching while my paying clients wait. And I don't want to, you know, deal with travel time, up ramp time, down ramp time, and everything else to go over and meet you for coffee for a half hour and then lose half my day and I don't even drink coffee. So when somebody comes to me and says, can we meet for coffee? Or if they say, 
hey, any chance I could pick your brain? My very first question is going to be, got a podcast? If they say yes, I say, cool, put me on your show. I'll give you my best stuff. Just show me some love and I'll give you the good stuff. And the best part is neither one of us has to leave our homes. It'll cost both of us zero dollars and zero cents for coffee that I'm not going to drink anyway. If they say, no, I don't have a podcast. Say, got some followers on social media? Let's do a live stream. Or if they don't have that, I say, you've got a membership program, you've got a coaching program. How about a webinar for your members? How about a, how about a, an, a guest expert interview for your newsletter readers? So there are many ways you can become memorable and many different ways you can take the exact same thing that you prepare as a podcast guest and translate it into different arenas and different formats where it's substantially the same thing. I mean, within the past two weeks alone, I think I've done uh, three podcast interviews where I've been the guest. Uh, I also uh, it was interviewed by somebody. I thought they had a podcast. It turned out they didn't. They were actually doing an interview with me. They were going to have transcribed and put in their newsletter. Same stuff. Uh, and, I, and I did have a f person a month ago, and this has happened several times. They said, no, I don't really get into that iTunes, uh, Spotify, Google podcast thing. I just go live on Facebook. I say, cool, let's go live on Facebook. Just send me a Zoom link or send me a BeLive link. Get me on here. Let's do this. That's huge. And That's what's awesome. great, let me rewind up one other thing. You really got me fired up here, Ben. I, and I've said this so many times on Business Creators Radio Show. Here's another lesson on top of a lesson for your listeners. You notice how many times I've mentioned Business Creators Radio Show. Here are two sub-lessons. Because I have studied and mastered seed-based marketing, I can make mentioning my podcast just a natural part of my conversation without saying, go listen to it. So just by talking about it and the stories about being the host, I raise curiosity where people can say, let me check out this business creators radio show. Now, conveniently, it is hosted at a domain called businesscreatorsradioshow.com. And if you look it up on a search engine, what do you think is going to come up when you type business creators radio show? The podcast. The podcast, exactly, exactly. And here's another lesson on top of that lesson on top of that lesson is when we conceived this in 2012, uh, we were going to call my consulting company the Business Builders Institute, and its companion podcast is going to be the Business Builders Radio Show. And right around that time, President Barack Obama said entrepreneurs didn't build that. Regardless of what you think of that statement, whether you agree with it, whether you think he was misquoted or what have you, the search engine issue was a problem because as soon as you type business builder, now we're hearing about Obama again. It's not what I wanted. So I went to thesars.com, typed in the word builder, and I looked at some different synonyms, uh, business architect, business developer, business creator. Okay. Business creators. Okay, stuff comes up, but it's not really competitive. I bet you I come up with something like business creators and have the words radio show to it. I could get number one on that organically. So think about how sometimes just by subtly renaming things or taking a slight shift over here when you're one of 50 people in this market and you just rename it ever so slightly, now you're number one. And the reason, and the reason I bring all this up is I want people to understand that when you are an in-demand expert and you have that credibility and you have that ability to share your story, that you can make an impact and you can do it very reasonably. The other thing you probably noticed is I told that story is how many loops I opened. Some of them I closed, a couple of them I left open because I want to leave the curiosity there and allow people to draw their own conclusions. I can give you... I'm going to talk about open loops here for a second. I appreciate you Let me go on here because I think I'm giving your listeners some great things. Um, ben, I don't know. I don't watch TV myself, but I do, um, I do like uh, certain television series. Uh, are you familiar with a TV show called The Sopranos? I've heard of it, but honestly, I don't watch TV either. Okay, so have you ever heard of a TV show called The Shield? Uh, actually, I haven't even heard of that one. Okay, let, let, okay, then for your listeners, let me tell you what they have in common. In The Sopranos, uh, at the very end of the final episode, you have the Journey song, uh, Don't Stop Believing, playing. 
and then they're right in the middle of a scene, and it seems like uh, there might be some guy walking up to Tony Soprano, who is the protagonist, and all of a sudden, the song stops and the screen goes blank. So we're left wondering, did Tony get killed? Did the guy just walk away? Did they decide to just cut the story and leave us to our own devices? And with the TV show called The Shield, uh, this was about a this was about a an anti gang unit in Los Angeles, and uh, and the protagonist, uh, so to speak, uh, his name was Vic Mackey. And at the end of all of his escapades as the leader of this anti gang unit, which included uh, murdering one of his own team members, uh, covering up the murder of another of his team members, uh, dealing drugs, uh, <laughs> uh, ripping off a uh, money laundering ring, and all other kinds of unbelievable crap he got into. In the end, he uh, had he pled an immunity deal in exchange for information, and part of the deal was he was hired to work for ICE. And he thought he was, uh, and he thought at first, okay, I'm going to work for ICE, so I'm going to do that same stuff, but I'm just going to be down on the border now. No, they stuck him in an office writing reports. And so at the very end, you see him at the end of the day after the lights go off in the ICE, in the ICE office, and a siren can be heard from outside, and he puts his gun in his holster and he storms out. And we're left wondering, where was Vic going? So... With those two series endings, the fact that loops were left open and we were left to think about, well, what happened to these people? Where were they going? What was the next step? Both of those shows ended like 10 years ago, and I get into conversations about this all the time. When you leave the loops open, and you know, just because you open a loop, you're not obligated to close it, that keeps people talking and speculating and theorizing. Go back to political discussion today, and, uh, and you can look at the president. This time, I'm not even going to say the president's name because I think it's going to apply to any president. And you love the person, you hate the person, you're ambiguous about the person. And either way, you're here in your armchair thinking, oh, what could they do differently? What should they do differently? But just the fact that there's the ambiguity there sparks the conversation, which leads to the creativity. So I want to ask you, because, especially because – of your, uh, your passion for history. When you think back on, you know, the founding fathers of America, for example, or some, somebody like Ben Franklin, I know yeah, might be a little bit of a gray area. Um, I mean, he's a, he's a total badass and he's going to be somebody who's remembered in history for a very long time, if, if not forever, potentially. Oh yeah. Are you trying to achieve that level of notoriety to where people remember you forever or are you kind of doing the things that you want to do like what's what sort of legacy do you want to create you know they say life is short but the fact is life is very long and you continue to live as long as people remember you uh i uh i i'll tell you i'll tell you this a little bit of a family story here is um one day just for fun i was visiting my parents and my sister my brother-in-law some other relatives were all there it was about 15 people and I and one of my cousins was there, was there, and I said, "No, no, no." Actually, it was my sister. It was my sister, and I asked her, um, "What are the names of our great grandparents?" And she wasn't completely sure what the names were. Now, I spoke with her about this on text just a couple weeks ago, and she said, "Well, you know, the legend of me will be here as long as it'll be." So she's looking forward. So looking backwards doesn't have the same meaning to her as it doesn't ha- as it has to me. Now, that's neither good nor bad. It's just. It's just the way things are. And I found it interesting because I actually do know the names of all eight of our great-grandparents. And I also know that uh, by using Ancestry.com, that some of the family lore about some of our great-grandparents is just completely made up crap. It's like, I got the paperwork. It didn't happen that way. So you discover a few things. That people live as long as they're remembered you find that the memories change over time. Uh, Like, for instance, my mother did not know that her own father changed the spelling of his name a few years before she was born. But I I discovered that through census records. Didn't know it. Unbelievable. And it's also interesting that on my father's side of the family, I've found first cousins of his he didn't know existed. His own... Parents, siblings had kids he didn't know about. So 
even within our own lifetimes, we can see some of the drift that happens just because, and sometimes you don't even remember why. That could have been because somebody got in an argument at a reunion somewhere 80 years ago. You don't know. Or maybe, maybe the generations were just not perfectly aligned uh, because somebody was way older or way younger or something, and they just didn't associate. There's so many reasons why this could have been. And I, and I know this because I have, I have first cousins who are old enough to be my parents, and I have first cousins who are young enough to be my children. So, um, I mean, you know, there's a pretty wide range here between, uh, between the 21st cousins that I have. And you, you see that as long as memories last, people live. And what's also great about that is as you look into things, you can rediscover people and bring them back to life. So yeah, I would like to be remembered long beyond my natural life. I'd like to be able to say I did something or that I said something that is going to be helpful to somebody somewhere down the road that I will never meet. What's your greatest theory? My greatest theory? Huh. I don't know if we'd call this a theory. This, this is one, this is one no matter how much of a memorable in-demand expert I am that I, okay, you see what I said? And then how I paused afterwards, lesson within the lesson within the lesson. Um, I don't know if I'd call this a theory, but I'll tell you what comes to mind when you say that. One of my own quotes, and maybe somebody else said this along the line, but I can't, can't find attribution. So I say this, and I put my own name afterward in the, in the memes. The one who says little hears a lot, which has multiple meanings. On the one hand, the less you're talking, the more you're listening. And another interpretation, the one who says little hears a lot, is people can feel confidence that they can confide. Notice two words, confident, confide. Same word, different, uh, different you know, whatever you call that in, uh, in sentence structuring. Uh, they... People will come to you and they'll tell you things, that they will share information with you that they really don't want to get out, but at the same time, they know that they can, they can vent to you. They can bring you into loops. They can, if they, they have something on their mind that really doesn't need to be said, but they got to tell somebody, they can come to Adam. They can come to Ben because they know that Adam and Ben aren't just going to run, run their mouth about it the next day. It's like um, I remember. I remember one time um, I was in middle school and I was already um, I was already working on a book. I already had in mind I was going to be a published author someday. That one hasn't been published yet. Uh, that is a fictional novel about a Latin American political leader. That is, I mean, I keep going back and working on it, and maybe one of these days I'll actually publish it when I can link it to something. I don't know. I've also thought about the possibility of speaking it out through a podcast because these people see people doing that. They'll actually, they'll actually found a podcast that's only designed to be online for a limited amount of time. They'll attract followers. They'll tell the story. Then they'll pull the transcripts and they'll put it in a book. So I remember I confided in somebody that I was working on this story. And then the very next morning, people were coming to me, oh, look at Mr. Arthur. I'm thinking what I shared with that person wasn't exactly a secret, but I thought that there were, that there were somebody where I could have frank conversations with about stuff without having to read about it as a freaking headline the next morning. So when you're the person who says little bit, hears a lot, more people will tell you those kinds of little things about them and knowledge is power. So some other situation comes up and it reminds you of something else and you're able to see things from a level of subtlety and from a larger view, just because more people share with you because they know that it will stop with you. You're not just going to go blab it. It's like I, it's like I warn people. I've, I've seen people where their best friend was some big major gossip. And I said, do you realize that this, this person isn't like uh, sharing their gossip just with you, that there's nothing special about you? Do you know that they're actually talking about you too? That all this stuff that you're confiding with them is actually buzz right over here? And they didn't believe it until I was actually able to pull up examples. And social media has made this so much easier. In fact, okay, this is actually turning into a theory. Uh, when I had that job that I held down while I was in MBA school, I worked there for four years, I used to start rumors. Like just stuff that was like 
too too out there to be true, but the fact that it was so out there make people believe it. And I would test sharing it with the select people just to see who I heard it back from. And that gave me a sense of where some of the networks were. And by doing that and just watching those information flows, I began to see connections that other folks might not have. That this person working over here in this department and this person working over here in this department, they may be connected in a way that's not right there for you to see. And that knowledge can be power, especially if you want to do a, like say, for example, you want to do a change management initiative and you want to do cross-department influence, you can start something over here that will permeate over here if you understand those dynamics. So yeah, the one that says little here's a lot and you look at who they're saying it to. So Adam, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. It's thank tru- you. Uh, truly been a pleasure to, to share this time with you. Uh, I have two more questions for you. Okay. Then we'll wrap it on up. Uh, the first is, is there anything about yourself that you think is an important part of who you are that we didn't talk about today? In other words, what did I miss? Oh, let's see. Um, As as William Shatner's character, Denny Crane would say, don't try and get inside my head, there's nothing there. Um, Let's see. Uh, Well, I mean, uh, I'll probably think of the answer to that question perhaps after we end this interview, but I think one thing that um, folks may find interesting if they're looking to discover more is that I, and we've kind of touched upon some of this throughout the, our conversation here is I try to look at some of the subtleties of things. I look for the connections that folks don't regularly see. And it's for that reason that I don't fill my Facebook wall with all kinds of political stuff, because again, we don't have the story until it has a chance to flesh out. And by the time it does, we've usually moved on anyway. That's why people get away with fake news. Uh, and, and that's an across the board statement. That's not a partisan statement. It's everywhere because uh, we sped it up so fast, there's no time to even stop and think about it. Whereas I'll kind of sit back and look at the subtleties. And, uh, and I've had, and I've had uh, cases where I'll go to cigar shops and there are people who have the opposite set of political views that I do, you know, but we're friends and we can have an open dialogue about it where we can share views without judgment and the ideas we're learning about each other. And one person noticed, he said, you know what, I've noticed you state your view and then I start talking and you shut up. I said, no, 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 no. It's not because you're silencing me. It's not because you've won over me and I'm not viewing it as a win or lose. It's because you are taking the floor and you're giving information that's going to give me information that's going to make me more informed. Why the hell would I give away that free gift by interjecting and trying to prove something that might mean something only to me? So I want you to take the floor and I'll listen to everything you have to say. It doesn't matter whether I agree with you. Because when I share my views, I'm not trying to convert you. I'm just simply sharing my views. I don't look at it as I'm trying to convert anybody. I just look at it as I have views on certain things. Um, I'm willing to share those views if you've shown me that you're uh, up to that type of conversation. And I'm not trying to convert you. You ask questions, I answer them. Um, I have views, I share them. And if something I say makes you go back later and say, wait a minute, then come back to me with it. Because I find that when you tell people they're wrong, all they're going to do is uh, go out of their way to show you how right they are. And I've, and I've had, and I, I even write about this inside Groundhog Days in the Vet Not a Business Strategy. Like if you say to somebody, you know, the president's a horrible person. Don't you agree? What you're more likely to do is trigger an argument because they'll say, no, I think the president's great. Now list their reasons why. And you can take president you can substitute that with governor uh you can put in your favorite comedian or your or or cats versus dogs it doesn't matter but when you state something and then you request or demand agreement with it you're actually more likely to get disagreement because you're causing the person to look at their own checklist and it's unlikely that your checklist and their checklist will match exactly even if you're overall simpatico in the main there'll be something there that will cause them to look at that and say, 
no, not quite. And now you've got an argument on your hands. What question should I be asking you with your experience, your knowledge, your, your genius that I just wouldn't think to ask? Huh. <sighs> see wow this 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 is really deep here this is really deep what i love what i love about project egg and what you're doing here is uh, and i've seen you do some of the, some of the other guests is you really cause us to explore internally and i think this creates much greater connections over time is you could simply ask me the question why i have cats and people see people see that I people see me posting pictures of my cats and uh, and they know that I'm uh, you know the, the the cat man of Las Vegas and you know you saw that one point in our interview where my camera kind of shook for a little bit that's because my cat jumped up on the desk behind me and rubbed up against it so I had to straighten it out and in our green room conversation she walked right in front of it a couple times she's sitting here right now sort of uh, in that sort of halfway napping mode but you know thank goodness. And when you ask somebody what kind of pet they have, it can tell you something about their values. See, for me, um, some folks will assume that I hate dogs. That's actually not the case. I actually love dogs. I think dogs are great. Uh, just this morning, actually, um, I was sharing with somebody that, oh, no, no, I, I know lots of dogs that I think are awesome. I showed her my parents' uh, uh, Pikachu. I showed her my sister's bulldog. I showed her my uh, my friend's uh, black Labrador. I mean, there's a there's a lot of great dogs out there. And uh, what's funny is uh, I tend to get along with dogs very well. And sometimes they're they're humans are surprised that their dog will just walk right up to me and then sit in front of me and shake. This dog that will not be normally friendly to a lot of other people, but they relate to me right away. So that whole I hate dogs thing just isn't there. But why would I like cats? Uh, to have as pets well that speaks to a few things one of which is cats are just candidly low maintenance I don't have a family here right now um, that's a, that's a journey that I'm still working towards and with cats they actually appreciate not having humans around all the time so when I leave as long as their bowls are full and their litter boxes are clean they're good to go for a while in fact they're happy to be rid of that human you don't have to walk a cat because they're not going to get in a harness anyway. All you have to do is uh, play laser pointer with them once in a while and throw their toys and everything, and they're happy as can be. And plus, since I have two of them, they entertain each other. And what's great about that is having cats from a lifestyle perspective gives me the flexibility where uh, when I have the opportunity to travel to speak on stages or to do a consulting thing, or maybe I just want to explore something and get away for a day or so, which happens every once in a while, sometimes on a whim, that... All I have to do is contact my cat sitter, make sure they're available and pay them the $40 a day and they'll stop in twice a day and play with the cats a little bit, make sure their supplies are all up and everything's fine. A dog would not allow me to do that because when you have a dog, they say that, well, dogs are smarter. They respond to humans more. That also means that they need more connection to humans. I've met dogs that had to be physically leaning against you to feel that connection. You don't really get that with a cat. I mean, my cat will sit on my lap, but she doesn't need it. She could take it or leave it, candidly. Um, uh, with a dog, I would need to be home more so that the dog got walked regularly. Uh, they would need more time to play fetch. Uh, they just have a greater maintenance to them, whereas the cat is more of an independent type creature. In fact, they value their solitude and their not being around humans. And that speaks to me. I'm somebody who needs to not depend on others. And I'm somebody who needs to have that flexibility where I don't necessarily depend on or am dependent on by anybody. Now, of course, I make sure my cats get really good food. I spend a lot of time with them. Uh, as you see, they hang out in the office here all the time. Uh, I've been advised by business strategists that it makes me look amateurish and unprofessional. I say, look, my cats supervise me. They work here. You don't. So... Cats are part of the brand, and I'm not putting them outside and closing the door. They can come in here as much as they want. And that goes back to us showing the uniqueness of our personality. Uh, just like you, you know, I've shared how I exude a certain side of my personality on Facebook, my personal profile, because it's meant to let people see a bit of me. Uh, this is another bit of me, is uh, my cats can come in, and they can, they can knock the camera over and interrupt things, and 
Yeah, that, that's just me. But see, what I also know is there's a lot of folks that are going to look at that and they're going to say, wow, that's, that's a guy. Uh, he obviously is passionate about animal welfare. He likes animals. He, he, I can see he has a big heart. I can see this is somebody who would truly care if I, about me if I worked with them. That's what I'm aiming for. The people who say, oh, it's so amateurish and unprofessional. Well, I can't really help them with their barriers. I can only show them my example. And maybe at some point they'll say, wait a minute. And they'll rethink things. But I'm not out to convert them. I'm only here to give them information that they can take or leave. And should they choose to take it, it may benefit their worldview in some way or adapt their worldview or not. There's enough for all of us. So it doesn't have to be. Well, Adam, I want to thank you once again for coming on the show and sharing everything that you have. I, uh, I do really appreciate that. And, you know, again, I, I know how busy you must be. So I appreciate you carving out the time to uh, come hang out with me. So thank you very much for that. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you very much, Ben. I really appreciate this. This has been, this has been quite an adventure. Let me tell you that. Awesome, man. And to everybody who's listening, watching, I want to thank y'all because y'all are the reason that I do this. And I want to thank you for supporting the show, sticking it out with us all the way till the end. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, basically, uh, again, I want to show my appreciation for um, a very, very interesting conversation that I am excited to share with people. And uh, if anybody wants to look at podcasting a little bit further, um, you know, at this time anyway, I don't have a lead magnet. I don't have a funnel. I mean, we're going to have those things and we're going to use them very strategically. We're going to use it to grow our business uh, very quickly. Uh, for our listeners right now, what I have is if this is something that interests you, we do have a Facebook page for, for in-demand expert. Go like that. I post there every once in a while. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Best place to connect with me is LinkedIn. That's where I'm most active. And uh, you can also visit my website, indemandexpert.com. Now, no matter what permeation of the website we do, because uh, the website is evolving very quickly as we grow, uh, one thing I can tell you that will remain evergreen is at the bottom of the home page of in-demand expert, there will be an opportunity for you to book a complimentary 15-minute chat, and we can explore and see where things go. No obligation. Let, you know, let's break the ice, and let's see what we can do for each other. Awesome. So everybody, thanks again for listening. Adam, thank you. And uh, let's change the world.